Hello and welcome to this morning's discussion of the critical role central banks have played throughout the COVID-19 crisis and on the role that they will play and could play in the months and years ahead. Never in peacetime have central banks acted as lenders of last resort in the manner that they have done in 2020. Interventions to stabilize the banking and financial systems have included the setting of negative interest rates, upending decades of thinking amongst economists about the zero lower bound constraint that many had believed existed for monetary authorities. The effect of printing of money to purchase financial assets, such as corporate bonds, has also been unprecedented in scope and scale in some countries. But perhaps the most significant intervention of all has been central banks' role of lenders of last and not even last resort to governments, and in some cases, notably the United States, to subnational government entities, both states and municipalities. Without these measures, there would almost certainly have been a funding for crisis for governments at a time of a health emergency like no other in living memory. The short-term consequences of the failure to act by central banks would have made a bad situation much worse. Yet the longer-term consequences of this massive monetary experiment remain to be seen. We'll get perspectives on all of those issues from those who have been central bankers and those close to the world of central banking in different ways this morning. Lest anyone look askance at the absence of serving central bankers from this morning's lineup, we've deliberately made that choice given the extreme caution with which central bankers have to weigh their every word. Hopefully, this will allow a less constrained, less constrained and freer flowing discussion. Just before we get into the meat of the topic, permit me briefly to run through the format and how we'll proceed. I'll shortly introduce William White, something of a legendary figure in the economic forecasting community of which I was a part for the decade up to the financial crisis in 2008. Bill will give the opening address to set the scene, after which we'll take questions and comments from you, the audience. So please feel free during his talk to put in your questions via the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of the screen. All of that should take us up to about 8.45, and then we'll go straight to the panel for a discussion. The panel includes Dana Idane, Kriakopoulou in London, Michael McMahon in Oxford, and David Roche in Hong Kong, all of whom I will introduce in a little more detail later. But first, let's turn to Bill White. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, for the, um, for the invitation to, uh, to speak to your audience today. Um, I, I haven't had any recent contacts with Ireland, but... Um, my, uh, my part of my family comes from there. I've got one grandfather from Cavan and uh, another great grandfather. I'm not quite sure from where, but uh, the link is there. Uh, the, the other sort of Irish link is that um, there's, there's a little joke that has to do with Ireland that actually sums up um, the theme of what I intend to say today. And uh, the joke you may have heard about the old fellow who gets lost in the winding lanes of Ireland and uh, he wants to go to Dublin and he sees an old man in the field and he says, how can I get to Dublin? And the old man replies, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, and that's basically the theme of what I want to say today. Um, I wouldn't, if I were you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, I want to say a few words uh, about uh, the role that central banks have played in the crisis. Um, then I want to go on to the question of whether they were right to do what they did uh, on the basis of I wouldn't start from here. And um, then I'll, I'll, I'll get into the question of the buildup of debt that has been the byproduct of what central bankers have been doing over the course of the years. And the really important question of how do we deal with the elephant in the room, which is all of these, these debts that have been building up. So let me, let me just pass to those, those, those themes. Um, <clears throat> the first question, and I guess this is appropriate to deal with in the opening statement, is what actually did the central banks do uh, during the pandemic? Well, the, 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 the first point to make was that we did have a huge problem. Uh, when the pandemic struck and it became obvious what the, uh, the implications would be for the real economy, uh, the financial markets just basically seized up. And uh, so what we had was a situation where all the credit spreads, you know, that represent the quality of the perceived quality of the credits that were being made, all the credit spreads widened out, um, the dollar rose, uh, volatility went way up, uh, the, the markets essentially ceased to function. And um, <clears throat> this was sort of a classic kind of risk off 
um, situation. We've seen this many times before. We saw it in the uh, in September in 2008. Very similar, uh, classic risk off, except for one big exception. And the big exception was that in a classic risk off situation, um, you find that the U.S. Treasury rates go down. And in this particular occasion, the rates went up. And they went up because even the treasury market, uh, the US treasury market was ceasing to function, which is something we, we've really never seen before. And so the situation was um, unprecedented and um, uh, demanded a response. And the central banks fortunately came to the rescue. Uh, their response was, was massive and immediate. Uh, policy rates were, were lowered. Um, the central banks announced their intention to increase uh, uh, the size of their balance sheet in various ways to provide liquidity, support the markets. Uh, the Fed, and the Fed in particular, in cooperation with the Treasury, uh, announced a whole host of new uh, initiatives and uh, facilities to provide finance to the private sector. Um, <clears throat> All of this stuff was unprecedented, particularly the interactions with the Treasury. Um, the Fed also announced a whole series of swap agreements to provide dollars to people who were non-US residents who desperately needed dollars for the financial um, uh, obligations that they'd gotten into. So uh, there, was a, there was a real problem and the central banks absolutely stepped into the gap and, and did what, uh, what they had to do. Um, I think what they did, they thought was consistent with their two primary objectives, uh, the first of which is to maintain financial stability. And the second, of course, was to maintain price stability. And whereas the first problem, as I say, the malfunctioning of the markets was obvious, uh, the issue of whether they should have done what they did in order to maintain price stability was a bit more judgmental. It basically reflected a judgment uh, that the influence of the pandemic would reduce aggregate demand more than it would reduce aggregate supply. And that the pandemic was essentially disinflationary as opposed to inflationary. In any event, broadly speaking, what they did um, was consistent with what they considered to be their mandate. Well, the second question, was it the right thing for the central bankers to do what they did? Well, clearly you can't run a modern economy without a sort of a functioning financial system. So in terms of financial stability, um, there's absolutely no doubt that what they did was the right thing to do. Now, having said that, uh, there is a longer term problem. And it's one that you alluded to, I think, in your, your opening remarks. And the problem is that what they did was really just a more extreme version of what they have been doing now in response to other threats, you know, really going back 30 or 40 years. So in a, some fundamental sense, uh, what they did was, was, not, was not new. It was sort of more of the same. And um, if you go back and you look at the history, and I'll do this very briefly, you can see this very clearly. So um, in the decades prior to the great contraction of 2008, for example, you know, what the, what the central bankers did was really starting in 1987, you know, with the Greenspan put, you know, there was a thought that the economy was going to turn down because the financial markets were in turmoil, the central, the, the Fed and then all the other central banks reduced interest rates drastically. Uh, then in uh, 1990, we had the bust of the property uh, boom in Japan, Scandinavia, the United States, Canada. Central banks responded the same way. 1995, we had the Southeast Asia crisis, and the response was to uh, ease off, uh, or at least not tighten, when probably all the other indicators said they should have done. Then we had the LTCM crisis in 1998. The response was ease interest rates. Then we had the MMT, the you know, the, the, the stock market boom and bust in 2000, the response was to reduce interest rates. Um, so by 2008, um, you know, interest rates had really ratcheted down to near zero in, 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 in many countries. And then we had the great financial contraction. And the response of the great financial contraction was essentially more of the same. 
with one little wrinkle, which was that the interest rates at this point had ratcheted down so much over the course of the previous 20 years, there was really no place for them to go. So then the central banks had to use all of this sort of experimental stuff, this quantitative easing and forward guidance and operation twist and all the other stuff. And so during the pandemic, okay, we've had just more of the same, but the experimentation has had to continue. So we have the interest rates have already ratcheted down to zero or even less than zero. We've had QE, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the big experiment this time was really the extension of the support for the financial markets from lender of last resort to market maker of last resort. But you can get the picture is that we've got easing, 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 and in an ever more experimental fashion. And that then raised the question of, well, why should we be concerned about more of the same? Or why should I be concerned? Many of the other panelists may not be. Why should I be concerned about more of the same? And I think the answer is that um, we were already seeing before the pandemic that what the central bankers were doing was questionable on at least three fronts. Uh, one of them, and I'll talk about each briefly, uh, one of them was that monetary policy was becoming increasingly ineffective in stimulating aggregate demand, which is what the central bankers wanted it to do. Secondly, it was showing a lot of unintended consequences. Uh, and thirdly, um, it was becoming increasingly clear that exiting from this policy of ultra easy money was not going to be easy. So let me just say a few words about e e each of those. Um, the question of being less effective. My own view is that there is a fundamental intertemporal inconsistency in the repeated use of monetary policy. And the reason for that is that each time that you use monetary policy, ease it in an, in, in an attempt to increase aggregate demand, you're inducing people to bring spending forward from the future into today. But of course, when today, when tomorrow becomes today, you've used up in a certain sense your, your, your ammunition to spend and your desire to spend more becomes less. This is basically what, what Chairman Greenspan was referring to back in the late 1990s. Remember you talked about the headwinds of debt? And that I think is a, is a fundamental problem. And when you sort of say, well, yeah, show me the, show me the numbers, uh, the, the numbers are perfectly clear that debt ratios globally under the influence of ever sort of easing monetary policy, debt ratios globally have been growing steadily. So <clears throat> when you look at the numbers, the numbers prepared by the Institute for International uh, Finance, for example, you know, the, the Bankers Club, that indicates that debt ratios at the end of the first quarter, this is sort of total um, corporate debt, household debt, plus government debt as a ratio of GDP. That ratio globally uh, was 331% uh, at the end of, two, of quarter one, 2020. That was 50 percentage points higher than prior to the great financial contraction. So if you thought the last decade, you know, the great financial contraction was a period of deleveraging, okay, in response to the crisis, think again, because at the end of that period, the debt ratio was 50 percentage points higher than it had been at the beginning. And two sort of central elements of it was that a lot of that increase in debt was in emerging markets. So that whereas the great financial contraction was really a problem of the advanced countries, now this debt problem permeates virtually everywhere. So we've got a real issue here with respect to debt. And just as an aside, I would mention that that debt ratio really at the beginning of this year was two and a half times um, what it was in 1980. And government debt, has actually now gone back up to the level it was at the end of World War II. So without, without the advantage of a war. So these, these debt levels have now become really worrisome in my mind. And um, of course, the pandemic has just made it significantly worse. 
Um, and I would mention too, that it's not just the quantity of the debt, it's the quality of the debt. So that, um, you know, we now have uh, the, the, the lowest income emerging markets now have debt levels that have gone back up to where they were prior to the last uh, occasion when debts had to be voluntarily reduced. Um, we all know about sovereign debt levels in the advanced market economies. Corporate debt now, it's a huge expansion of triple B and of stuff that's just flirting on junk. So it's not just the quantity of debt, it's the quality of debt. So that's one of the things that, that, that worries me. Uh, monetary policy has become less effective. The second thing is all the unintended consequences. Okay, and, and there, there's a whole host of them and I'll just go through them very, very quickly. Why one of them is, is the threat to financial stability. So, you know, we, we think, for example, now I just mentioned about the intervention of the central banks after the, after the pandemic. And you sort of say, okay, well, that was terrific. And that was obviously designed to increase financial stability. And indeed it did. The, the problem that one faces is what are the longer run implications of what they did? And <clears throat> the problem is if you're constantly squeezing the margins of the financial institutions, they become steadily weaker over time. And you, you hear the banks complaining about it, growing sense that the banks are not gonna lend uh, because they're worried about their future capital adequacy. Uh, this is what Marcus Brunermeyer calls the, re the, 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 inter the reverse interest rate. You know, the interest rates go down to the level where they become not expansionary, but contractionary. Uh, they also have monetary policy, I think has had a big influence on financial markets and on the functioning of financial markets. So you, you look, for example, at uh, asset prices, and I'm thinking particularly about equity prices in the U.S., where it is now clear that monetary policy has been the, the driving force between this massive expansion in equity prices in the States. Where will this all lead? What is the potential for a reversal? That's a problem. Uh, we've been observing over the course of the last 10 or 15 years, more and more issues having to do with market functioning. Okay, Price discovery has basically disappeared in many markets. JGBs, there's some days there's no transactions in government bonds at all. Um, credit spreads driven right down to very, very low levels. Uh, flash crashes, I, I could just go on and on. And the absence, the failure of the US Treasury market to function in the spring of this year was just the sort of the denouement that the end of the road in terms of that particular process. So that's the first thing about the unintended consequences. The second one is I think it leads to a reduced potential over time. It reduces aggregate supply. So you think about monetary policy as increasing aggregate demand. And what I'm saying is it's ineffective over time. I don't believe it does that. But what it does do over time is it reduces aggregate supply, which is the potential of the economy to grow. And it does it in two ways. Um, I think it leads to a lot of what Hayek would have called malinvestments or bad investments uh, of new money. And I invite you to think about all of these unicorns that have no profits, no prospects for profits. We're talking about Uber, WeWork, Netflix, Tel <laughs> Tesla. The list goes on and on of these companies that are not making profits and probably are not gonna make any profits over time. Those are resources that could have been used for some other productive purpose. What Hayek used to call malinvestments. And it's not just the new investments that are malinvestments, it's all the old investments. So we've been observing now for almost a decade, this continuous rise in what they call zombie companies. The companies that are kept alive basically by the kindness of the banks and the kindness of the financial markets. These are companies that are generally defined as having lived for 10 years, but have at least a three year history of not making profits that are equal to the interest payments that they have to make, okay? They are zombies. And they are not only tying up resources, but they're competing in an unfair way with other companies that might've made it 
otherwise had it not been for the competition of the zombies. So we got a real problem here on the aggregate supply side as well. The third thing is the exit problem. Um, <clears throat> I think it's becoming increasingly clear that we're getting to a point where the central bankers can't do anything other than what they're doing. So you observe all of these unintended consequences and you observe the growing ineffectiveness of monetary policy. And you say, I want out because I'm making things worse, not better. But what we all know is that the debt levels and all the other imbalances that I've spoken about imply that the central banks can't tighten up because if they do tighten up, they're going to create the very problem that they're trying to avoid. So we've got ourselves into a place where we don't want to be, okay? Or as I said right at the beginning of this presentation, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. Now the question is, <clears throat> moving on to the next question. Why have the central banks done what they've done? Um, I'm going to be sort of, I, I could be kind and say they've been forced into it by governments, governments not doing what they've done. But for the moment, let me be, let me be unkind <clears throat> and say that I think the fundamental problem is that the central banks have got an analytical framework uh, that just uh, is wrong. And I don't know, maybe Michael will want to come in and come in on this one. Uh, I think the central banks have made a fundamental philosophical or ontological error. Uh, that is that all of their models are simplified to the point that they are, and they assume that the economy is basically simple, understandable, and controllable. That's the fundamental assumption, and it isn't. It is not simple, static, controllable, understandable. It is a complex adaptive system, uh, which is extremely hard to understand and even harder to control. And that fundamental mistake that they've made has led on to all sorts of other mistakes. And just very briefly, I think the biggest mistake that they have made has been the relentless pursuit of price stability. We have had 30 years of globalization, particularly the entry of China, Slovakia, all the previous command and control economies back into the world trading system. We've had the baby boom coming through. We've had a huge positive supply shock to say nothing of the, nothing of digitalization and all that stuff. We've had a huge positive supply shock that wanted to push prices down, that was pushing prices down, that should have been allowed to push prices down and the central banks leaned against it in order to preserve price stability. And there's a whole pre-World War II literature on this question that has been totally ignored. Uh, also totally ignored was the, the example of history, not the history of economic thought. History shows there have been many, many examples of prices falling because of positive productivity shocks that caused absolutely no problems whatsoever. But the leaning against that by the central banks, because their framework, their, their, their econometric and analytical framework, in fact, contains no credit, no financial system, no money, all of the problems that their policies were creating were in a certain sense invisible to them. So they did what they did. And that I think is why we are uh, where we are. Um, the central banks too, I would point out their models also assume we'll go quickly back to equilibrium. Um, that is to say back to full employment. And when you sort of think about it, and I haven't got time to get into it, it is pretty astonishing that your analytical framework says really bad things can't happen, but they do. And it says if they do happen, you'll come out of it very quickly. And 10 years later, you don't, and they're still pursuing the same policies. So there's some interesting questions that we can get back into. The last question I wanna deal with, and now very briefly, is the question of where to from here, because we've got this big problem of the debt overhang, which is the elephant in the room. Uh, doing what we've done is, you know, again, kicking the can down the road. It becomes increasingly um, improbable and undesirable. Uh, if you've got a big debt problem, there's only four ways to go. Uh, one of them is austerity. Uh, and it doesn't work for countries. 
Okay, it works for households, but it doesn't work for countries. The Keynesian paradox of thrift. Look at Greece if you want to see the implications. Second thing you can do is you can uh, increase real growth to pay down the debt over time. Uh, unfortunately, it's a kind of oxymoron because if you've got all of this debt as headwinds, uh, it's not going to work. And I would also add in the globalization, demographics, all the stuff I've just talked about is having increased real growth. All that stuff is going into reverse to say nothing of climate change. So, and adaptation to climate change. So re faster real growth is not going to be, a, this is not a silver bullet. The third thing you can do is financial repression. Uh, basically, you combine more inflation uh, with keeping the interest rates down. And this is what was done quite successfully after World War II. Uh, my contention would be that this is not going to work, um, or it might work too well. So that against the backdrop of the debt, what's much more likely, I think, is we'll have debt deflation to worry about, you know, the, back to the 1930s. So getting inflation is going to be hard. If you do manage to do it against the backdrop of fiscal dominance and the printing of money to support government debts, the thing, if, if inflation starts to rise, it could very quickly get out of hand. Uh, the world is highly, the economy is highly nonlinear, unlike the models. We've seen this many times before in Latin America. It could very quickly get out of hand. So I think that way of doing things is, is a dangerous way to do things. And then you're left with the last, and I'll finish with this, the last of the, um, the things that you might do, and that is restructure all of those debts. And um, we should be thinking much more seriously about that. I, I was pleased to note Martin Sandu in the FT two days ago or three days ago had a whole article about it. Uh, I, some of us have been saying this now for years the OECD, the BIS, the IMF, the group of 30, all of these people have been saying for years now, we need much more attention to orderly resolution of debt problems. Our administrative and our judicial procedures are totally inadequate, whether it's to do with private non-financial debt, financial debt, or, or sovereign debt. Above all, the procedures are totally inadequate and we should be spending a lot of time on it. So, the last comment, the patient had preconditions before the pandemic arrived, and those preconditions are going to make it hard for us to get out from where we are. Um, if we do turn to restructuring debt, it's going to have huge political implications. And reflections along these lines are going to call the competence of central banks into question. If we have to start thinking about the kind of things that I've just been talking about, Central banks are going to have to speak a lot about what they did and why they did it and, and, and how, in part, the governments themselves are culpable. Um, the, the central banks have been using all of these macro prudential instruments that gets them into the, how can I say, the areas of competence of regulators. The more they go into financing government debts, particularly with quantitative easing, the more they're getting into the realm of, of, of fiscal policy and not just monetary policy. So we've got some huge challenges ahead. And from the political perspective, the governments, uh, or sorry, the central banks uh, are going to find that um, it's going to be much more difficult to maintain the quote unquote independence that they had in the past. Uh, life in the future for the central bankers is not going to be the same as it was in the past. So I'm sorry, I've gone over a little and I apologize. Uh, many thanks for that, Bill. I'm sure uh, you haven't cheered many people up this morning, um, but uh, you've raised a really large number of very important uh, issues, which um, I think we'll be thinking about for, for quite a while. Um, could I just start with your perception of the central banking community more generally, that up to the great financial crisis, um, there was a sense of almost smugness among central bankers and maybe for good reason there was a feeling that they had done their job very well they had maintained price stability and the economies were growing reasonably well and that they had really got it right in terms of macroeconomic management uh, then the great financial crisis hit and some central bankers that i knew were in a complete state of shock just did not expect this didn't see it coming um, didn't know what to do um, 
But despite that, it doesn't seem as though there has been as much change to emerge from that shocking period uh, amongst the central banking community. Is that a fair comment to make or would you just elaborate on how you see the consensus mindset among central bankers 12 years on from that event? No, I, I think, Dan, you, you, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I gave a paper at Jackson Hall, I think, in 2003 with my colleague, uh, Claudio Boreal, in which we talked about sort of the orthodox way of looking at things. This is prior to the great financial crisis, which basically said we've done a terrific job. Everything, the great moderation, everything looks great. What's your worry? And we were saying, but underneath the surface, and really I was saying then, I'm sad to say, more or less what I'm saying, what I was saying today, um, under the surface, uh, these problems are really building up. And of course, they materialized in the financial markets in 2008. Now, I have said earlier on that I think the central banks have continued doing what they're doing, in part because they've, 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 they've continued to maintain uh, to believe in the usefulness of their old analytical frameworks. And I've said, I think that's not true. To be more charitable, the central banks found themselves in a very difficult situation because in 2008, they had to do what they did to, to support the financial markets, just as they did during the great pandemic. And they, and they did a great job then. But what happened was that almost immediately, fiscal policy, which had been expansionary turned contractionary and all the regulatory stuff was directed not towards resolving the problems that were already there in 2009 and 2010 the regulators turned to crisis prevention and sort of putting in new regulations that would make sure there was no future crisis well what that meant was that both fiscal policy and regulatory policy were in contractionary mode and it left the central bankers as the only game in town. And in a certain sense, they were sort of pushed almost politically into doing what they did because nobody else was there to do it. So they continued to do what they did. And whether, which of these two motivations was the more important, you know, the being wedded to the old analytical framework or the sort of the, the, the quiet, quiet sort of political and, and, and social pressure to do what they did, I don't know, but the bottom line was that they basically kept on doing what they were doing for another decade. And what I would have said was they should have been addressing the debt restructuring problem and recognizing that their own policies had played a prominent role in leading to the crisis. They should have been addressing that stuff 10 years ago. Good. So folks, uh, questions and comments are welcome. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A function where you can type them in. Uh, do identify yourself um, if you can, please. That will be good. Coming to your point about orderly debt restructuring, um, Bill, is there such a thing as orderly debt restructuring on a large scale? Yeah, you mentioned economies, the non-linearity in economies. We saw during the, uh, the European sovereign debt crisis how the move towards restructuring or the fear of the restructuring of sovereigns uh, led to really disproportionate impact for the wider Eurozone economy and indeed wider further afield. And that ultimately uh, financial, uh, you know, one, one person's financial liability is another person's financial asset. And you start writing down financial assets in, in in a large way, and maybe it can't be done or in an orderly way. You weaken the balance sheets of those who hold those assets, and you end up with a domino effect of, of banking and business failures. Is, is that not a real risk of, of using debt restructuring on a large scale to, to bring the debt burden down? I think it, it, it has, I think you're absolutely right, and it's got huge implications for the central banks. And um, the question of the extension uh, of doing what they have been doing, um, but in the context, uh, not of trying to stimulate aggregate demand, uh, but rather in terms of maintaining financial order at a time when fears of debt restructuring might be leading to disorder. So there's gonna be a very um, interesting interplay uh, between all of these various factions as we move forward. And uh, I totally share your, your concerns uh, that we are, back again, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, 
that uh, the markets might uh, very easily uh, be spooked into some kind of disorderly reaction. Um, but I think that um, this thing has to be done in one form or another in a certain sense. Uh, I mean, for a, 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 an Irish audience, I don't know whether you remember Andy, Andy Cap, whether he's still in the papers, but you know, where's, where's the rent spent? If you can't pay, if the creditors can't pay, the debtors, sorry, if the debtors don't pay, the creditors don't get paid and they know it. Uh, so the, the, the responsibility of central banks uh, to, to lean into that situation, I think is going to be a, a great one. But having said that, one hopes that one, what the underlying process will be one of trying to do this in as orderly a way as possible. Because if you just simply said, let it, uh, you know, let it rip, um, disorderly debt reduction, that is to say, everybody trying to get out. And in the end, of course, the debtors are still trying to, trying to pay on terms that become increasingly impossible to manage. Um, you, don't, you don't want to look into that particular abyss. A, a discussion that I had with people in Tokyo um, uh, over quite a long period of time, but and it's recently come up in a European context. Some, uh, some people around the Italian government have been raising it. And that is that central banks simply tear up the IOUs that they've purchased, particularly sovereign, uh, sovereign bonds. Um, and that is the way to resolve the problem. Well, I wish, <clears throat> you know, I, I've, I've thought about that. And in the European context, it's a bit more complicated, but, and I don't, profess to truly understand the, it's been a while since I've looked at the T accounts in Europe, let's just put it that way. But broadly speaking, I think this is all a bit of a hoax, frankly, because when you think about the consolidated balance sheet of the government, which includes both the governments and the central banks, in effect, all that's happening is that the central banks are buying in all of this long-term debt, okay? And, um, what they're, what, they're, what they're paying, what they're doing is they're paying for it with an increase in the deposits held at the central bank. So in effect, all they're doing, it's a huge debt management operation. They're just buying in long-term debt and replacing it with the shortest term debt there is, which is overnight money at the central bank. And insofar as the relations between the governments and the central bank are concerned, it's all just pure, pure, you know, to say we forgive your debts, it's all pure accounting because all the profits of the central banks, which is the interest that they receive in the government debt, they remit back to the governments, you know, after they've done their own expenses, they remit back to the governments. So to forgive the debt is just basically to say, don't pay us the interest and we won't pay you the interest back. So it's, it's just a wash. This whole thing is just, um, it's, it's not only a delusion, it's a dangerous delusion because you're replacing long-term debt, okay? At least that you've, you've got the debt out there for 20 or 30 years with overnight money at the central bank, which is callable. So I, I um, maybe there's something I'm missing, but um, I, don't, I don't get it. I've talked about this with, uh, well, I, I don't get it. Well, we'll definitely, it's a subject we'll pick up in the next round with the other three speakers for sure. Can I go to the questions that are starting to come in now? Can I go to Ronnie Downs? Um, he asks, if central banks can't keep doing what they're doing indefinitely, what sort of event or shock would precipitate a disorderly unwinding? All of the collective in incentives seem to be in favor of continuing on the path we're on. Is Brexit a potential catalyst here, for example? Thank you. Well, I've become in, in recent years a, a great advocate of um, complexity economics, um, which is basically saying, let's start off with the assumption that the economy is a complex adaptive system. And there's many, many of these systems, both in nature and society. And um, there's huge lessons to be learned from looking at these other disciplines, if the economists were only prepared to do so. Uh, one of them is that if the system itself is unstable, anything can trigger a problem. So you say to me, what might be the trigger? The answer is it could be anything. 
uh, in a certain way, you know, when we looked at the U.S. in uh, 2008, we, you know, in retrospect, it was the housing bubble that, that did it. But when you look back at it, I mean, it could have been could have been anything else. I mean, the European crisis could have started uh, significantly earlier uh, had circumstances been a little bit different. So anything could trigger this thing off. Um, at the moment, I guess what I worry about the most, although the the, the central bankers have thus far held it off is corporate debt. I mean, there's been a massive increase in corporate debt. Much of it is triple B, which is right at the edge of um, junk. Uh, if some of this stuff gets downgraded to junk, uh, then of course, um, a lot of pension funds and others can't hold it anymore. So the selling could, could get started. Um, that worries me a lot. Uh, dollar Shortages of dollars you know, by people who, who really need them to roll over their obligations in dollars and whether they can get them. Because in the end, the only people that produce, the only person who produces dollars is Mr. Fed. And um, there are various reasons to doubt his capacity and his will to do so. Uh, up until now, of course, the Fed has done absolutely the right, the right thing. Uh, but I have worried for a long period of time about um, com countries that you know, might need dollars that can't get them in South Africa, Turkey, China. Um, even internally, uh, Jay Scott has written a whole book about uh, Dodd-Frank and the way in which it should constrain the Fed's ability to deal with crises domestically. Janet Yellen herself has publicly sort of said she's worried about it. Uh, up until now, um, the Fed has been allowed to do whatever it wanted to do, that it felt it needed to do. But of course, just recently, uh, we've had uh, Secretary Mnuchin uh, basically try to close down some of those Fed facilities because they have. And so he wants to sort of take the, take the money, as it were, reduce the contingent liability because it makes his budget situation look better. But you all know from the European situation, remember when Mario Draghi said, we'll do whatever it takes and trust me, it will be enough. He never had to do anything because he said he would do something and he had the right to do it. Now there's an interesting question with, you know, the Fed says we're gonna support the markets in various ways. And Mr. Mnuchin has said, well, certain of those ways are now gonna be constrained. Will that make a difference? I don't know. Will Brexit make a difference? It'll be a, a no deal, will be a big thing, but it'll be a big thing for Britain. Will it be a big thing for the entire world? I go back again to my complexity stuff. Anything could trigger off uh, instability in a system which is fundamentally unstable. And that's why we have to start focusing on how can we go about restoring stability? And in some way or another, the debt issue is gonna have to be dealt with. Um, Conal McQuillia has a, two questions, in fact. He raises the issue of a global savings glut. Um, he wonders, is the problem in, uh, is the problem we're facing in the world more to do with poorly developed financial markets in Asia, not dealing with the save, savings glut, rather than uh, with central banks in the Western world? And he also asks, um, picks up on your point about the uh, pre-World War II literature on, on inflation, uh, the positive supply shock, shocks of the Industrial Revolution pushing prices down. He asked, could you expand a little on the lessons of that literature and what it would have implied for inflation targeting during the first decade of this century with the emergence of China and the positive supply shocks that you mentioned? Let, let, let me start with the, the let me start with the, 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 the second one, the supply shocks. Um, in, in a sense, it's, it's, it's a very simple thing. I mean, the, the literature basically says if you've got productivity increases, what we know is that over time, real wages have to go up. Real wages are wages over prices, w, w over P. And then the question is, well, to get real wages up, do you let the W go up and the P stay constant? Or do you keep the W constant, let the P go down? And um, there have been many, many instances you know, thinking about the 1880s. Anyway, there's a whole literature on this stuff. Um, that when the P went down, it didn't do any harm. You know, so we have this, this, this myth, as it were, about deflation is terrible. 
deflation is not terrible. It was terrible during the 1930s, but the literature seems to indicate it was, it was actually a unique event historically. Most examples of deflation have been periods of rapid productivity growth that, that drove down prices um, and the lower prices were basically what allowed ordinary workers to increase their real wages and purchase all the stuff that was being produced by the increase in productivity. So it, it, the, the, the whole thing sort of added up and it wasn't a terrible, terrible event. Um, and uh, there's quite a literature on this. I mean, some of my colleagues at the BIS uh, have written a couple of papers on this, uh, Claudio Borio and uh, Andy Filardo. So people can go back and take a look at that. Um, sorry, remind me now, what was, the, what was the first question? The first, uh, it's just right off the screen. So there was a uh, savings club, the savings club question, oh, yeah. the um, savings club. particularly in Asia and the, the um, underdevelopment of Asian let, parts. Let, of let, let, let me be another renegade. You know, having said, I, I don't understand um, writing off the government debt. Uh, I don't understand the savings glut either. Uh, to, to me, um, it's a retreat again into a kind of pre-war, well, well, an unwelcome retreat into a pre-war literature. Because when you think about it, it basically says we're at full employment. Uh, we've got the intersection of the investment function and the savings function. And uh, if you've got excess savings, well, you know, then sort of bad things happen. Um, but to me, what this totally ignores is Keynes. You know, the, 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 the whole idea of the Keynesian revolution was that the interest rate is not determined, okay, by the intersection of the investment and the savings function. It is determined really by, in the literature, the LM function, what does the central bank do in response to the situation in which it finds itself? Well, what do the financial markets do? And income becomes the thing that equilibrates uh, savings with investment. Uh, that to me is the essence of the Keynesian revolution. So to say there's a savings drive, it's just to say that there's forces acting to reduce demand below supply. And then the central bankers have responded by doing what they've done. And I guess my contention now and it's one that in light of the pandemic an increasing number of people seem to be saying is that we, we actually should have been using fiscal policy if there's a shortage of demand. We should have been using fiscal policy because that's got fewer, un, it, it's more effective over time and it's got fewer unintended consequences than the use of monetary policy. So I, I guess I go back to your, the question here and basically say, I really reject the starting point, which is to look at it from an S, S equals I, you know, pre-Keynesian model.